evening and welcome to Chatham Marconi Maritime Center's virtual EDFUI Distinguished Speaker Series presentation. This is our first ever virtual presentation in this speaker series. Um, as a communications professional, EDFUI brought the world and its stories to the American public. As a Chatham Marconi Maritime Center volunteer and museum docent, Ed wrote and produced two videos explaining the importance of wireless radio communications to the rescue of the Titanic survivors and the outcome of the Battle of the Atlantic during World War II. The Ed Fui Distinguished Speaker Series was established in his memory in 2015 to promote knowledge and understanding of history and world events with a special focus on the science and development of communications technology and its profound effect on our lives. This season, we're launching a new exhibition, Radio to the Rescue. You're all getting a, a sneak peek right now at one of our new exhibits, which highlights how radio communication ended the isolation that every mariner experienced at sea. The hard lessons learned from dramatic early and even more recent sea rescues will be explored in new exhibits in our museum galleries and special programs, including three one-of-a-kind virtual Ed Fui Speaker Series presentations. Thank you for joining us this evening for the first of these three special programs. I will now invite Liz McCart, Vice President and Chair of our Museum Committee, to introduce our special guest speaker this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kristen. Good evening and welcome to our 2020 season. This is a date that we have been anticipating since last year. This is our first program, and we are so pleased that you are joining us. Our program tonight will hear the story about the first time that major lo loss of life was prevented by radio. In 1909, Jack Bint, a Marconi radio operator on the RMS Republic, sent a wireless distress signal when the ship was struck saving numerous lives. Jack Bin's heroism continues to be celebrated today by his granddaughter, Virginia Lovelace. She'll tell the story of her grandfather, both the person and the radio operator. We originally planned to have Virginia talk in person. However, circumstances resulted in a change of plans. But we are thrilled that we can see and hear Virginia using technology. A little bit about Virginia. She obtained her undergraduate degree in physics from Washington University in St. Louis and her medical degree from Columbia University. She was appointed a postdoctoral fellow at Rockefeller University and recently retired from Cornell University where she was an associate professor in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. So Virginia, without further ado, please tell us about Jack Bins. Thank you very, very much for uh, inviting me. This is really quite an honor. Uh, I first want to tell you that I knew my grandfather quite well. He passed away when I was 16, but when, uh, when I was a young girl and then growing up, uh, I spent almost every Saturday afternoon that I was in New York City, which is where I mostly lived. Uh, I spent that afternoon with him. My younger sister always had to take a nap. So I had him all to myself while my mother, my aunts went off and my <laughs> grandmother all went shopping. So uh, I then uh, of course had the opportunity to speak with him about his adventures. But since then I have actually had the privilege of working on his uh, well, autobiography, I guess. And what I'm going to tell you about today is, uh, will be extracted and then of course illustrated by, uh, with that autobiography. So what I'm going to try to do, and we'll see whether we succeed, is I'm going to share the screen. Here we go. And um, I'm going to play, and I hope everybody can see this because uh, my grandfather was involved with the very first rescue at Open Sea coordinated by wireless. And actually that rescue ended up having implications for the Titanic disaster 
as well. So it's quite a, I hope it, you'll see it's quite a tale. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my gr grandfather's childhood and youth. The thing to know was that he was a uh, poor boy, and he, in fact, he was born in the Union Poor House in Brig in Lincolnshire in England um, in 1884. And I have a picture here, uh, a friend of mine took a picture of the house where he and uh, 10 or maybe even 11 people all lived when at the time that he was born. So um, they had a room downstairs and a room up under that roof. And, and, that <laughs> and, and the one other thing I have here, is thanks to a cousin I discovered on Ancestry, um, uh, a little photo of my grandfather as a, as a little boy. Um, uh, he grew up, however, in Peterborough. And what I'm going to do uh, is show you maps where all these places are located. So you see there Brig which is where he was born. And then his grandmother and his uncle and uh, their families went down to Peterborough. His mother, meanwhile, um, basically abandoned him and uh, went off to where Grimsby, where, um, which is just to the east of Brig. So he grew up uh, in Peterborough with his uncle, William Benz, who was a tailor and uh, then uh, an Uncle Walter who worked on the railroad, and I think it was Uncle Walter that introduced to him to his first job. But before he even got there, he was so fascinated with electronics. He had gone to an agricultural fair in Peterborough and uh, took uh, a sixpence, which for him was a huge amount of money, and, uh, and actually put those stethoscopes that you see in Edison's ear there, ears there, and he listened to the Lord's prayer recited on the phonograph. And I think from that moment on, he was hooked on all things electronic and uh, wireless then became his uh, special love. But before the wireless, he worked on uh, wired um, communications. Uh, he passed his school leaving exams. In England, you could pass school leaving exa exams at 13 and then start going to work. And obviously his family was not very well to do at all. And he felt it was his obligation to go and um, uh, help the family finances. Um, so there's the telegraph office. That whole building there uh, is actually the railroad station. And Peterborough was a place where uh, railroads uh, north and south in England and east and west in England all came together. So what he had to do as a messenger was, in fact, to take um, message messages from one part of this whole uh, railway complex to another, and uh, they were received at the telegraph office, and then he had to go across the tracks. And um, what usually there was no problem crossing the tracks, even climbing under uh, railroad cars. But um, this one time, they actually attached an engine to one of the cars. Usually they moved very slowly and he could skip under because they were pu pulled by horses rather than an engine. But this particular occasion, he scooted under a, a, uh, a train that was being pu actually pulled by an, uh, an engine. So at age 14, he had a horrific accident. His legs were nearly severed. The doctors felt, uh, you know, here's a poor boy. There's nothing we can do for him. Why cut his legs off? Why amputate? Which is what they would normally have done. Well, they didn't amputate. Um, and uh, as a result of this, he survived the accident with his legs well, I can't say exactly intact, but he did actually, uh, his legs were preserved and he spent a year in the contraption that looks exactly like what this picture shows. One of his most outstanding characteristics was that he was very friendly and very curious. And so he became a pet of all the doctors in, that, in the hospital. Uh, and uh, they would bring him books to read and although he never had a, you know, a university education at all. He, he was well-versed in mathematics and physics and really developed a very profound understanding of electronics. And the result of that 
time that he had to study, he, um, he then went back to work at the railroad and proceeded to be an expert in all the systems you see here um, uh, that the railroad was using at the time. And um, if anybody has any questions, I can go into the details of all these, but suffice it to say that the one that's in the, in the lower right-hand corner um, uh, used uh, sounds rather than uh, say the uh, movements of uh, uh, paddles in the middle one or uh, ticker tape type things with the paddles on the upper side. And it turns out that that was a huge help when he went to work with the Marconi people. Um, so by age 17, he became a uh, senior officer, second in charge at the Colchester offices. And Colchester, you see the star in the picture down below, Colchester was the center for all the communications for uh, the uh, Great Britain uh, throughout the world. And you can see all the uh, connections that that were there. That's just the Eastern Telegraph system, but they were, all of that came through Colchester. So being second in command meant that he was really second in charge of Great Britain's communications through telegra telegraphy with the rest of the world. But he soon realized that there was something better to do, uh, and he joined the Marconi companies because he saw that wireless was going to be the future of. Um, communication. <laughs> and it's still very much the case, right? Uh, so in 1904, he, he went to the Marconi Company's tele telegraphy training school in Liverpool, and he finished his training in three months, and whereas the usual time was six to ten months, and he earned his uh, Marconi cap. That's a photo of him with his, his cap. And, uh, and then he was put in, on, on shipboard because Marconi at that time was uh, working to be the main person to provide wireless communication systems on ships. And the first sets of ships that he was on were these uh, German ships. And uh, it's, here's a whole series of them. And... Uh, one of the other jobs that he had to do when he took these messages in was to bring them down to the um, uh, printing office, actually. Every ship of any consequence at that point had a printing office. And then uh, they, when the messages came through, um, they could make newspapers out of them. And as you can see, there's a picture of the uh, people on one of the ships that he was on uh, at some point, the Hamburg American line, Liner America, and uh, there they are reading newspapers. Uh, this is really um, a huge advance in communicating with people on shipboard to think that you could spend, you know, a, a month, two months, three months sometimes crossing the Atlantic and have no communication with anybody except the people that are around you and have no idea what was happening in the rest of the world until you landed uh, on, on shore. So this was a huge advance. And of course, business people loved it because it meant they could follow the stock exchange and battles and what have you, uh, wars, what have you. Another thing he did was, and this is kind of funny, he, um, Marconi sent him uh, on a special task on the Blücher. You see that ship down there in the picture below. <clears throat> and the Blucher made these North Sea cruises up above the Arctic Circle. Um, and uh, they, he, what he had to do, because he was always doing a little bit of research for Marconi as well as, as, um, as just the, uh, you know, the usual things he had to do, sending telegrams and so forth. Um, what he did was to uh, examine what levels of interference there would be at, at the above the Arctic Circle. So he took advantage of the opportunity to actually send a wireless message, but of course there wasn't anybody at the other side uh, to to receive it. There was nobody around. Another strange job that the wireless operators had to do on shipboard, and this actually is a um, postcard that was sent on that particular trip. And um, somebody happened to uh, 
notify me that they had had this postcard. But you see there at Spitzberger Blüchel, uh, uh, 13th of July, 1906. And that, that is a postcard that my grandfather actually franked because one of the jobs of the Marconi people was to uh, frank the, uh, the mail that would be sent out. Um, well, it turns out in 1908, there was the beginnings of the rumblings of the, what turned out to be World War I. And uh, the German uh, uh, government decided to bar anybody who was foreign uh, to work operate uh, uh, wireless on German ships. And so there we go. My grandfather was taken off the German ships and uh, the, his first task was to carry out research on various antennas and how they would perform as they were, uh, you know, implanted in the sand on the, uh, on the Belgian side of the English Channel and how they would communicate then across uh, the channel. And you see that uh, paddle steamer there, Ostend Dover, uh, that was probably the fastest steamship in the world at the time, it and its twin. Um, and uh, she would do 30 knots, which was way faster than the blue ribband rate of coming across the Atlantic with a, uh, a ship with a, with a regular screws. But this paddle steamer, my grandfather said to me that it was the most uncomfortable ship he'd ever been on because it rocked, it rocked both sideways and, 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 and it pitched and rolled. And, <laughs> and he said it was just terrible. He gets, and he was not prone to get seasick, fortunately for the work he did. Um, then they sent him off to, uh, to Ireland. And I will say this for all of you who have uh, any Irish ancestry, he absolutely fell in love with Ireland. And uh, so he was there for six months and had a, a very wonderful time, again, working for um, uh, roughly six months, working for um, Marconi. But then in 1908, he got his assignment on the Republic. Uh, and when I say 1908, he went on his first trip uh, in that December on this ship. And that is the ship that, uh, as we'll see, eventually sank after uh, experiencing the collision. But there she is. And uh, in order to be on the uh, Republic, um, the, he, <laughs> he had to obtain a certificate of proficiency in radio telegraphy. And um, we can actually see what his grade was. <laughs> um, because of uh, a, a aficionado, a person who absolutely loves, uh, um, in, uh, who lives in Liverpool and loves wireless and has a, uh, as a ham radio operator said, found out that um, he sat his exam on the 25th of November, 1908, at Mar Marconi's depot at Seaforth in Liverpool. His sending speed was 26 words per minute and he received at 29 words per minute, which is pretty average. It's, it's, it's good, but not, not, you know, it's not extraordinary. There are some others who did much faster. Uh, his knowledge of rules was judged to be fair. And I will say this, my grandfather was not necessarily always a rule follower. He, uh, <laughs> and his, but his technical knowledge was considered good, and he impressed the examiner who made a special mark that indicated that Binns was, quote, a good man. So, um, you know, he, he and, the, and that's a picture of the certificate he ended up with uh, that I happen to have, and I'm very proud to be able to have this. <laughs> and, okay, so there he is on this ship. And the Republic was actually um, uh, on, a, on its Mediterranean cruise when um, my grandfather joined it. And uh, they went to Messina. There was a horrendous earthquake at the end of uh, December 1908. Uh, and um, well over 100,000 people may have died in this earthquake because there was also a 45-foot tsunami right after the earthquake. And that, and that picture will show you, shows you a little bit of the kind of damage uh, in that area. Um, now, uh, just to tell you a little bit about what wireless looked like 
on, um, on shipboard. The first thing to know is that the term radio shack applies. These little buildings were put on the deck of the upper deck of a ship well uh, after the ship was built and is, you know, it was add, it was an add on. And I put a question mark here because this, this particular photo is in, was in um, newspapers before the Marconi, uh, before this event. And, and now in this particular example, they're calling it the Marconi station of the White Star Liner Republic. I have no idea whether it's really that, but what you can see is it's a little shack basically with a couple of uh, portholes on it. And the other thing notable is that it sits on, an, on the boat deck and you'll see the uh, uh, life-saving boats right to your, uh, right to your left. <laughs> So that's what the cabin looked like outside. And this gives you some idea of what the cabins look like inside. Um, they, you'll see the bed in the, uh, uh, the corner. And actually in my grandfather's version, he had a, a, a separate space for his bed with a wall kind of separating it from the uh, equipment there. On the um, left-hand side is all the sending equipment and on the right side, the, the receiving equipment, and in the middle where it says G, that's actually the, um, where the key, the, the telegraph key was. And B, by the way, is how they got electricity into the system, but he also had storage batteries, and because when, as we'll see, when the collision occurred, he no longer had any electricity from the ship, and so it was a good thing he had batteries as well. Um, this is a drawing from Marconi's 7777 patent, which was the um, major patent that Marconi had, had um, uh, submitted. Uh, it ended up being overthrown well in the middle of the <laughs> 20th century. But this is, this is the, the version that, that was, he was being used at the time. Um, yeah, and um, so, uh, if you have, by the way, in the question part, if you want me to come back here and explain what all of this is about, um, I will, but I just want to point out, it says C there, and that's the spark gap. And the uh, voltage has to be high enough. In other words, the electrical pressure, as it were, has to be high enough to send a spark across that, where it says C, across those two balls. Um, and once that spark goes over, you have completed a circuit, and then you can send a message out the aerial where it says, uh, well, the wire to the aerial is A, and F is the aerial itself. Uh, so I can explain that in detail if you want me to uh, later. But I want to get on to the collision, because this is the, the, the collision between a ship called the Florida, uh, which was a, an Italian Lloyd ship, and the Republic, which was a white starship. And um, I, this is to sort of give you an idea of the layout um, and where all this collision occurred. And what you see, we'll start with New York City on the, on the, and Long Island on the left-hand side or on the west side of the map. And as you go across, you'll see a, a little ship image called Baltic, and that will be the rescue ship eventually. Uh, you see the collision of the Republic and the Florida below it. Um, Nantucket Lightship, they, had, they were going to pass that. There's some other ships to the, uh, to the east which are coming in and steaming. Um, and uh, the key thing for all of us uh, who are fond of Chatham and the Maritime, Marconi Maritime Museum, etc., you'll see there's Cape Cod Bay. And and uh, and the and uh, and uh, that's where you'll find your your Chatham uh, and your museum. And the other thing to note there is Sconset or Sia Sconset, Sconset, and that is uh, well, we'll see what that is. Okay, uh, so this is what the collision was like. Um, the collision occurred on January twenty third at about five and change in the morning. What's supposed to happen, it was a deep fog. The reason it was a fog, of course, is now you're in the middle of the Gulf Stream on a very cold night. The air was very cold, so the fog was intense. 
uh, whereas the Gulf Stream, you know, the water evaporates and it was immense fog. And that's always a big fog there. So whenever uh, ships either are coming into or going out of that part, they knew darn well to have their fog horns blowing, you know, at regular intervals all night. Um, and that's what happened with the Florida and the Republic. And they, the foghorns getting closer and closer, and they started uh, sending horns so that they would, you know, and the principle was each would turn, turn, turn to port and, 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 the, and the ships would not collide. Well, um, the Florida did not do what it was supposed to do and instead plowed right into the side of the Republic and it hit the Republic um, in and right amidships, and um, immediately the um, engine room was flooded with water. For, my grandfather said the biggest heroes in this whole adventure or misadventure were the men working in the boiler room. The, someday we need to discuss the rather atrocious conditions that these men lived under, but they managed to um, shut off the steam, get rid of the steam in the boilers, um, and then uh, clamber out from the boiler room, all in the dark with water flooding in, and uh, they managed to save the ship. If the colder water from the ocean had hit those very hot boilers um, and the steam was still in there, the whole thing would have exploded and everything would have been for naught. So this gives you some idea of how what happened uh, as the as the Florida collided. The bow of the Florida was pushed in like a concertina, but not the very top deck of that bow. That still hung out over, and it raked. If you if you can imagine that it was going from the back of this picture all the way to the front, and you see on the right hand side the um, uh, the um, uh, where the gashes, I guess, is the right word. Uh, all, all along this, this these were saloons, the male and uh, ladies and men's saloons. Uh, the gashes uh, as the as the bow crashed and crashed and crashed as it went along, and what you see in the back, you see sort of a part of the deck hanging down a bit. Underneath that was uh, the uh, radio shack. And uh, that, that crushed uh, the part of the radio shack. And, it, and my grandfather said that if he had been sitting, sending instead of being in bed at that moment, he would have been surely killed. And, and what did happen was that his apparatus was scattered all over and he had to, in the dark, because immediately the crash, right after the crash, all the electricity went out, he had to basically reassemble everything, find his storage batteries and put it all, all together. Now, the other thing you see in this picture to the right, uh, left-hand side rather, um, are two white uh, things and those are shrouds because it turns out in that the only people who were to lose their lives in this event were the people who were uh, killed or in one case severely injured uh, by the, during the actual crash. Every single other person was saved. So, um, but as you can see, <laughs> a big wreckage mess. Um, and so what did my grandfather do? He sent out a, a message uh, in the form of CQD. In fact, the exact message is, CQD, here MKC, which were the call letters for the ship, uh, shipwrecked. And why CQD? I mean, you'll hear SOS, SOS, SOS. Well, um, here's a little history of CQD and SOS. The first thing to know is that Marconi adopted CQ, and it doesn't stand for I seek you. No, it stands for uh, C. Um, Q, which was used in the telegraph world for all stations, because if you, um, a Q in English at least, always, if it's gonna be a real word, always has a U afterwards. So the telegraph people chose CQ as to 
make it obvious that this was something very serious and you have to pay attention to it because you'd normally expect C, you know, whatever C and then Q, U, I, C, K or whatever. Instead, it was just C, Q. And um, Marconi himself added a D to that uh, letter, letter series. Um, and um, he chose it to stand for distress um, because people had not very closely understand that CQ would mean distress. And um, in the meanwhile, um, the, the German um, International Telegraphy Group and the International Commission of, on Telegraphy decided for SOS because it's a very simple, it doesn't mean save your souls or whatever. It's just a very simple da 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 that you could instantly recognize um, when, when it occurred. And so uh, that, was, that was why the SOS, but the US did not, did not uh, ratify this agreement and Marconi, because his, he was on ships basically that were going back and forth across the Atlantic, he stuck with CQD and his operator stuck with CQD. It's worth knowing that um, um, uh, as the, because the uh, Marconi, because the US had not ratified the convention, uh, as I said, the CQD was in use in these transatlantic uh, trips but it was fun to know that my uh, pre president Taft um, actually visited my grandfather in his wireless office. He, he was a rather large man, so he couldn't fit in exactly, but he stuck his head in and, and they had a long talk. Um, yeah, he, 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 he was over 300 pounds. Uh, anyway, he talked about SOS as a better choice and uh, when eventually he became president, he pushed ratification. And what you see there is that the Senate finally ratified the convention on April 3rd to go into effect 1912. Um, and, but it wasn't, it was too late for the Titanic. So um, now, one of the things my grandfather ran into, this is a picture of a, of a, of a uh, wireless key ran into in the dark as he managed to break this thing. So he had to hold it together in order to uh, transmit. And he, he said his, his fingers became incredibly cramped doing this, but nevertheless, he was at the, at the key for, a, well, many, many hours. Um, and the, the place where he could communicate uh, because he had a very weak signal he was able, nevertheless, to communicate with a Marconi station on Sconset. And this, um, this shows you a picture of the uh, station as it then was with the very high aerials. And then the Sconset station and Jack Irwin in particular had the uh, dynamo power to then send a very strong signal to the ships in the vicinity. But the other thing that was fascinating is that they were able to send uh, the message to New York. Uh, and here's an evening edition of the New York, uh, New York World um, and um, the latest extra. And you'll notice the price was one cent for this newspaper. <laughs> and it, um, it talks about, and people followed actually in real time, everything that was happening. You'll see another drawing there. Um, so um, it was thanks to wireless that the world then knew what exactly was, was going on at sea. Uh, you know, when you think back at how many countless groups of people uh, on, on shipboard were lost at sea, never to be heard of again, and no idea what happened. But this actually was available to the world as it was happening. Um, so the, the rescue. Um, the first thing was that uh, CLB, who was the captain of the Republic, uh, decided that, uh, and he, he conversed with the captain Ruspini of the Florida, and they decided that the passengers would be safer on the Florida because the Republic was sinking, not that fast, but it still was sinking. And the, um, the Florida wasn't sinking quite so fast. Uh, so, all the passengers were transferred 
from the Republic to the Florida. Now on the Republic, they had what's called an accommodation ladder. You could walk, you know, basically walk down to a platform and from that platform get onto the rowboat and then get rowed across. But the Florida, which was other, you know, it was an immigrant ship. It had passengers who were immigrants uh, to the US following the disaster in Messina, that earthquake, it was filled with those passengers. It had 15 first class, and otherwise everybody was uh, steerage um, and, and absolutely terrified as you can imagine. Uh, and the ship did not have an accommodation ladder. And so pe people from the Republic had to climb up that ladder. Now, when I say people from the public, they had been crashed into in the night and many people came on the deck with their slippers, with their nightgowns, uh, and did not know what had happened, had no chance to go back and, and collect their things. And so everybody had to climb up that ladder. And, and I, my grandfather said it was quite amazing to see how, how the courage that people had climbing up that ladder, uh, which was slippery and wet and very cold. Um, and I just want to uh, point out that uh, thanks to uh, the internet, and I love wireless, as you can imagine, I uh, got this photo from a family member of the man who's in, in the middle. Um, you see the star, and then there's a, a fellow in the middle that, uh, white star line, and then there's another fellow right below him. And that fellow was the quartermaster, and he had taken a picture uh, when they were in Genoa rescuing people from Messina the first time that they had been to, uh, to the Mediterranean uh, with the Republic after the accident. My grandfather was on the ship at that time, and they, my grandfather knew these people. Um, they rode all the passengers from the Republic who had survived over to the Florida. And then later, as we'll see, they rode all those passengers plus the passengers on the Florida all the way back uh, to the rescue ship, which was the Baltic. So uh, when I say Dottie, these men really, you know, worked very hard to save all these people and succeeded. Uh, and so I was mentioning the Baltic, and this is a uh, was also a a um, a White Star ship, but it had a much better uh, set of equipments. And uh, this gives you some idea of what that ship uh, looked like. I put arrows there uh, because, in fact, this particular ship had a special antenna arrangement, so it could actually capture um, messages much better. Um, and then also uh, this gentleman, Tattersall, he's in the wireless room, and that wireless room was much better uh, set out and equipped, and it was built in as part of the ship. So it was altogether a, a, a better arrangement. Nevertheless, uh, how did the Baltic, in fact, find the uh, Republic? Because, of course, the Republic was sitting dead in the water, no lights except little oil lamps or that, you know, a handful of oil lamps. And it was an incredibly long effort to get the Baltic to the side of the Republic. Because you didn't, wireless wasn't directional. You could not tell where a signal was coming from. So when my grandfather was sending signals to Sconset, which is where he started out, Sconset then sent signals to the, uh, uh, across to the, um, the Baltic. And the Baltic had to sort of maneuver in the fog, because now we are towards nighttime, maneuver in the fog. And, uh, and eventually, it did not, they did not want to actually collide <laughs> with the Republic and have it really truly sink um, um, or collide with the Florida for that matter. So it took hours and hours of communication between the Baltic and uh, eventually my grandfather and they zigzagged over 200 miles in order to finally come together. And 
the very the, the very last moment when they thought, oh, we're we're reasonably close, but we have no idea where you each are. They decided um, that they would send off bombs. So they sent off one bomb and my grandfather would say, the Baltic did, I can't hear you. Then the Republic sent off a bomb. They had these special bombs that would sort of flare up and make noise. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. They, the Baltic had one bomb left, the Republic's none. So what my grandfather did was have all the people that were still on the Republic, and there was a sort of a skeleton crew, everybody else had been brought to the Florida, set them out uh, facing outwards in a circle. And everybody was to listen for that very last bomb and point the direction in which that, you know, from which that bomb came. And they had coordinated that the bomb would go off at an exact moment in time. Uh, they coordinated this through the wireless, of course. And my grandfather heard a very faint sound and pointed in the direction. And he claims the fact that he heard that faint sound was because he had so trained to hear faint sounds uh, through the wireless system. But he was able to point in the direction he then ran down to his um, uh, his uh, radio shack <laughs> and communicated uh, the direction to the Baltic, and the Baltic was able to come alongside the Republic, and uh, and so every, everybody was saved. And here is the Baltic coming into um, uh, New York Harbor and um, all the passengers cheering. And uh, just to point out, in, when we talk about rowing, there was 1,522 people were rowed all together into the Baltic, plus, of course, what the Baltic already was carrying. And it was notable that the Florida, which had been sinking very low in the water, uh, once it was relieved of all these people, it started to, it was finally able to get its way back to New York Harbor. Um, this, all, so there was the Republic. They put a skeleton crew on it, and my grandfather included. And this is a photo that he had. And there's also other ships, and you see the fog is lifted, and a bunch of uh, other ships congregated to the area uh, and then rescue ships came, but they were not able to rescue the ship. I've, I found this uh, photo and my grandfather talks about being aft as the, um, and you know, on that aft deck, as, as the lifeboats were hauled back up onto the, onto the Republic. And, um, and, there, and that figure you see there is he, I think that's my grandfather actually judging from the the, the post, the, the figure that, that's sort of under that thing that looks like an arm. Uh, and this is what the Republic looked like at, before it sank. Worth noting, um, they had put a tarp over where the gash was, so now you can see exactly where that, um, that the bow of the um, uh, Florida mashed into the Republic. And if you go up, just look above there, and to your um, left, you'll see all these little posts, and that is holding up the roof of the of the of the promenade deck there. If you go um, to the aft, you'll see that there are no more of those little posts. They were all raked off and removed, and if you you can kind of see some wreckage. Uh, as you go along, and that all that wreckage uh, was um, was caused by the bow of the of the Florida. Um, there's one um, sh lifeboat there that was sort of twisted in its davits, so it could not be uh, put into the water. But otherwise, um, they had enough lifeboats, or they, so they thought. This gives you some idea of what the bow of the Florida looked like as it, as she came into. Uh, New York. Um, and you can see on the picture on the right hand side the point of the Florida and that was sticking straight out as it raked along the deck 
and then finally collapsed. And by the way, the people who were killed on the Florida uh, were killed by the, they were in the, in the bow and were, were crushed there. But as you can see, there was a, a p real potential for that ship to, to go down as well. Uh, so what is the aftermath? Um, first of all, <laughs> my grandfather ended up being a, hailed as a hero. He, he felt very strongly he had just done his duty, but they, they managed to trick him to go to the Hippodrome, which was like the big show place in, in, in New York City. And um, suddenly there were flat, floodlights shone on him and, and he tried to escape and all the chorus girls were uh, clamoring over him. And he finally he managed to run away from the chorus girls by hiding in the elephant stalls. They had shows there with elephants. And he figured that the chorus girls were not interested in getting into the manure uh, that the elephants produced. And he managed to escape them and eventually leave. Um, and of course, there were newspaper accounts and uh, talk of bins in America. Grins, they called them CQD bins. Um, and, uh, but this is what is fascinating to me. This is a photo. When my grandfather got back to London, um, he was awarded a gold watch by Marconi. And you'll see Marconi there um, sort of to just to the right of the of the lamp that's there, handing uh, the watch to my grandfather. And the look on my grandfather's face fits what I understand his mood to have been there. Because Marconi was hellbent, excuse the language, on using this event to persuade ships to put in the Marconi system. And he was busy no negotiating contracts. And so what he wanted to do was to make maximum use of this disaster. And, um, and, uh, and, there, and of course, maximum use of his Marconi boy, my grandfather. And what he did was, um, well, this is a medal that they, that they made. That's all very nice. And that's, uh, but this is the, um, the thing that the, my, my grandfather made him do, namely join Luna Park, which was the day in those days, Disneyland, Disney World, Disneyland, the, you know, that was the equivalent, and, uh, and have a show um, all summer long where he was tapping away at a key and there was water flooding and everything. Um, <laughs> and and uh, uh, my grandfather never, ever talked about this. I only found out about it afterwards and, you know, after my grandfather died and I was looking into this matter. And um, because he was so ashamed that, he, you know, he was being used essentially by Marconi to become, um, you know, to make use of him to, as advertising for, for a, uh, a future. And there he is. Now that electrical show uh, was in that fall of 1909. And to the best of my knowledge, although he's advertised electrical show, Jack Ben sends wireless messages free. To the best of my knowledge, he did not participate in that show. Instead, he managed to get an assignment uh, back to sea. And uh, there he is in his uh, uh, Marconi summer outfit on the Adriatic and his captain was Captain E.J. Smith. And this is where the Titanic starts folding into this story. Because in fact, my grandfather was very good friends with uh, Smith. They, he liked Smith very, very much and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so when Smith went eventually from the Adriatic to the Olympic, he wanted my grandfather to be the Marconi man with him. Meanwhile, Sealby, who was the captain of the Republic, um, was, ran into a very serious problem that there was no inquiry ever, and to this day, into the sinking of the Republic. And there's a lot of you know, thought about why this could be the case. But in fact, 
uh, the result was that they never learned a proper lesson of what what could happen when two ships collided or as in the case of the Titanic the Titanic collided with the um, iceberg my grandfather maintained in 1910, in 1911, and in 1912, that there should be at least two, you know, there may be a Marconi operator and there may only have to be one of those, but there should always be somebody um, who would be listening to incoming messages on every ship. And you don't have to be trained in detail about how to recognize either CQD or SSS, SOS, what you needed to have somebody who could recognize that signal and then wake up the operator if the operator should happen to be asleep at that point. And as we know, at the time of the Titanic, um, the operator of the, um, of the nearby ship um, was asleep. And uh, the captain of that particular ship um, uh, thought that the rockets that were being sent up by the Titanic were in fact not uh, distress signals, but actually celebrations of the Titanic's first maiden voyage and so forth. No, there was no inquiry and there was no discussion of what needed to happen. And there was a common belief that a ship would sink sufficiently slowly that you could load everybody on the uh, rowboats uh, and, uh, and save everybody on the lifeboats. So you could row to another ship and you could row in another ship. Yeah, no, this wasn't happening. They did not learn that it was in fact the wireless that brought everybody to save the, the people uh, in the Republic sinking. And in fact, it was interesting that my grandfather, as I said, Captain Smith, who eventually was on the Titanic, um, invited my uh, grandfather to be with him when he was assigned the Olympic. And this is a picture of the Olympic on its sea trials. The Olympic was, um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, launched. And then uh, the Titan, I mean, the Olympic was doing sea trials while the, um, Titanic was going to be launched. Um, and so my grandfather was actually on that sea trial. And when the ship landed in Liverpool, he was told, bye bye, you can't be a Marconi man on that ship ever. And that was a message from Bruce Ismay, who was head of the Wright Star Line, who did not want somebody with such a bad luck situation to be on one of his, you know, his big new ships. So, and he thought, no, uh-uh, bad publicity, bad luck, no way. And there was nothing my grandfather could do. So he was assigned to other ships. And in the meanwhile, he met my grandmother. And uh, she gave him an ultimatum. She said, you're not going to see anymore. So in 1912, and she waited another two years, by the way, to, to decide to marry him, but that's another story. Uh, but in 1912, he said, okay, fine. If I, I, I don't go back to sea, I'm going to be a newspaper reporter. And so he got a job with the Hearst uh, newspapers and he had a decision to make. Do I go back to the U.S. as a, as a you know, citizen, I mean, not citizen, but you know, not a radio man anymore, but just to go to, to get to the U.S.? Um, do I do that with uh, the Titanic or the Miniwaska? And the Miniwaska was going to get there a couple of days ahead of the Titanic, and he could not wait to see my grandmother. So he took the Miniwaska, and he became a newspaper man. And that was, he got to New York City on a Friday, and the Titanic sank on that Sunday. And the first thing he had to report on really was the Titanic disaster. And um, why I have a picture of Senator Smith there and a tug, that's a, and, and then Wanamaker. Well, um, Wanamaker building was, had a wireless installation that you can see on the top there. And that was the, uh, was sending them, it was through that 
installation that the news of the world was, news of the Titanic disaster was being sent to the world. Well, his newspaper had him write article after article after article about Captain Smith, about the about wireless, about everything. Um, but then they got the brilliant idea of sending a tug out to meet the Carpathia, which was the rescue ship for the for the Titanic. Um, and uh, so it just happens the Library of Congress has a photo of this because what they decided to do was to put my grandfather with an inst a wireless installation on this tug to go out and meet the Carpathia and communicate more immediately. Um, but instead, what my grandfather ended up doing was getting messages from Ismay that mess messages were, he, tr he transmitted the message from Ismay, who was on the Carpathia, having been rescued from the Titanic, was sending messages to the White Star Line in New York, keep the ship, the Cedric, there, and we will put everybody from the crew of the Titanic that had survived, put them on to the Cedric and get them to England so there would be no inquiry in the US on, on this accident. Well, these messages were going back and forth uh, and they had to go, my grandfather actually served as an intermediary for these messages. So the, the, the weak signal that was coming from the Carpathia went to the uh, Tug Scully and then went to the various stations along the coast. Uh, so my grandfather knew what was up. And one of the big troubles you run into, if you are a wireless person, you should never divulge the contents of um, messages. But the people he was with on the tug figured out a way to get that message to Senator Smith, who then hightailed it up to New York as fast as he could with subpoenas in his pocket. And as the Carpathia came in, he was able to subpoena and uh, basically bring in, as it were, um, the uh, Ismay uh, and all the rest of the people from the uh, Titanic. And uh, actually, my grandfather actually um, also spoke at those hearings and described what he knew and experienced. So that's a bit of my grandfather's story. This is just another little bit of it. This is uh, September of 58. I think, I think it was actually an Easter picture that uh, was um, finally uh, developed in September. But in any case, there's my granddad there. Uh, and uh, he died in the next year. Uh, but there I am. There's my grandmother uh, on the far left, and there I am, and there's my aunt, and my grandfather, and my mother, and uh, my sister, and my cousins. And the thing is, my granddad loved the fact that he had uh, two girls, and all girl, uh, he was an ardent feminist, I will say that for him. So I'm very proud of that. But then, this is maybe the future, that's my little grandson. <laughs> so now it's time to uh, stop the share and uh, show me or everybody. Let me see how this works. Um, yeah, I have to go escape. There we go. <laughs> I hope you like the story and I'm ready to answer any questions that come up. Thank you so much for your attention. Oh, that was uh, fabulous. Thank you so much, Virginia. I feel like um, we really know Binzi now. And uh, we, saw, we saw a lot yeah, of I, wonderful- I had, I had promised myself, I promised myself I wouldn't say Binzi, but I can't help it. I mean, he was, he was so, he was such a loving human being and, and very modest. And, uh, you know, I only did my duty was what, what he always said. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Very humble, very humble person. And we could tell by the expression on his face in some of those pictures that he didn't like that attention. No way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, good. Good. so, so we, questions. Yeah, we have, um, so we have a comment. It says, what an interesting story. Thank you for sharing it. 
Um, and so we do have an opportunity for others to pr um, ask questions. And if you go to the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see Q&A and just type your questions in there and then we will um, ask Virginia to answer them. <clears throat> So we'll give a few minutes for that. Um, but I, I do want to comment, Virginia, I think that what you showed us was that radio is, a, is a, an amazing invention. And it, it really is, a, it's, a, it's a miracle. However, you know, it really does depend on the stability, experience, um, and perseverance of radio operators like your grandfather. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a, a willingness to, mm, yeah, to, to prioritize the message, I will say, over your anything personal. I mean, my grandfather, for example, I didn't talk about this, but uh, the, they made an effort to uh, tow the Republic at, at least into uh, shallower waters so they could salvage it. And uh, so my grandfather volunteered to go back on. That was that last picture where he's in the aft of the ship. Uh, and eventually it did sink and the towing didn't work. Um, but again, you know, part of his job was to get that towing all coordinated as well. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it failed and he, 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 he left the Republic before it in fact sank. Uh, but uh, again, they were met, they were able to rescue the captain and the second officer who had stayed on the Republic until it sank. Uh, they were able to rescue them from from the ocean. You know? Yeah, yeah, so, that's fabulous. Okay, you know, okay. It, we have um, we do have a couple of questions wonderful. now for you, Virginia. Uh, how long were the Florida and Republic close together after the? collision how did they communicate this is a three-part uh, yeah. was there radio on the Florida excellent question first of all uh, you should know that the Florida had no wireless at all um, and so um, the, the the need was for the for the you know it, it had my you know it had to be through the Republic that any communication would happen uh, and um, they were close together in the collision uh, pretty much throughout the day. Uh, I mean, the collision was at five and change in the morning. And um, the decision to row everybody over to the Florida was, oh, uh, well, <laughs> I, should, I should really look the an exact answer up. But, you know, it was all the way through and until till through late evening. And they communicated through, um, what do you call them? Um, megaphones. Uh -huh. <laughs> And um, okay, and a very good question about the side key. I can see the questions actually, Liz. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, and Great. and uh, and Glenn has a question about the side key, and this is was a very interesting system. I'm um, I'm wondering whether I should go back and mention how this worked. Uh, let me let me go back to the. Um, I'm just going to share the screen again here. And hold on, I'm going to get to um, that, and I'll come back. I'm going to go back. We're going to go back. We <laughs> we'll go back to the key because that's a very interesting question. Okay, the first part of the question, I'm going to just show you again the um, the that's the key, but I'll come to that in a sec. Um, the wireless arrangement here. Uh, what you have here under A is the uh, down aerial, and I is the up aerial. And then G was the, where the key is in the middle. And what you could do sitting there was to, in fact, whoopsie, uh, use this side lever um, to either make a connection, which you'd now see. Uh, you see. You see the side lever, okay? And then uh, the side lever is currently down and it is sitting in a little um, uh, pocket, if you will, I don't know what you might want to call it, of copper. And that is connected to uh, where the key is. Do you see that? Um, um, and, and so when you press down the key, in fact, this, uh, this lever, when it's down and connected, what you're going to have connected it is to that aerial 
which is in that screw on the far um, left hand side. And that, that will then send the mess, or well, it's beyond the aerial, it's the, uh, you know, the induction coils and everything else, but basically it goes to the aerial. So when it's down, um, you can send, and he had broken that whole thing off. So in order to send, he had to hold it by hand onto the, where that knob is on the left-hand side, on the side of the lever. He had to hold that whole thing together because he had broken the lever off and also the thing that that holds the lever in place. Do you see what I mean? Is that making sense? Um, okay. All right. So uh, let me just uh, stop the share and uh, okay. um, hit escape. And here I am again. Um, and uh, so that now, uh, does that answer your question, Glenn? Um, because I hope it does. And if it doesn't, ask again. Uh, and then the question is why nobody knows why the Florida didn't go to port when it heard the foghorn going, getting closer. And there was never an inquiry and you never heard from Ruspini why what happened happened. Ever. There's no mention anywhere. And uh, it, it's one of those incredible mysteries. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of speculation but there's no exp real explanation at all. And, uh, you know, but, you know, human beings make mistakes. <laughs> and sometimes well, mistakes are more da disastrous than other mistakes. Yeah. It's interesting there was no inquiry. Was it customary to have inquiries at that oh, time? Oh, you had to have an inquiry. And, and the other thing is that if you were, uh, he, he, my grand, my, I mean, uh, Sealby uh, signed all the, um, master's tick, uh, um, tickets for all the other people on uh, all the other crew, right? And so they could go back to sea, but he, he was not able, of course, to do one for himself. So he never went back to sea because you can only have your captain's ship reinstated if you, in fact, um, got, you know, if there was an inquiry. Now, there's a lot of speculation out there as why do there's not an inquiry and no uh, one, you see, there's, this is 1909, and we're working our way up to World War II, World War One, rather, sorry. Um, and what, what was happening? What was, what were the kinds of, if you will, machinations that were going on? Plus, you have to remember at that time, the world was, uh, the world in general was on a gold standard. And that gold had to be transported back and forth across the ocean. For example, if, if you were going to make a loan to Russia, as, as Martin Bailey thinks was what was happening, you would have to take that gold <laughs> to cover that loan all the way to Russia and had to go across the Atlantic and, and you know, had, had, had actually to French banks, which were giving a loan. Uh, so there's a lot of mystery Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of things that could have been happening there um, that people really don't, you know, we, we don't, we just don't know. But my grandfather was warned off. He met up with Sealby after all of this and said, you know, he said to Sealby, you know, I want to write a story about all this because he loved to write. And, uh, and Sealby said, you better not. So he wrote it, you know, <laughs> about a year before he died. He, you know, he, he finished it up pretty much in, in, uh, in 59. Wow. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 After all the protagonists had long gone, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then he was a wise man too then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, we, we don't seem to have any other um, questions, Virginia, but I would like to um, encourage folks to go out to your website that is quite extensive. Do you want to um, give us uh, the um, the address for that? Yeah, it's uh, uh, in fact, I can I can type an answer to that. Okay, in the questions, I can do that. And then I can also say it as I type, which is to say www dot Jack bins dot org. And I also have a, 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 a Facebook page, and, um, uh, which is facebook.com 
Jack Ben's Marconi operator, one word. Great. Yeah. Great. And, and you may be publishing another book soon. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I am. I'm doing I'm doing two books, actually, because um, I, as you you may or you, you already know, Liz, but I've been working. Whoopsie. I got the ocean in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is fabulous. Uh, anyway, I have been working uh, quite a while on on this. And this is his biography plus, uh, you know, about half of it or more is, is notes, because one of the things is that the pe people nowadays, I mean, we're talking well over 100 years after this, had no idea who these people are. And when my grandfather wrote his biography, he, he assumed, of course, that people knew because it was only short, you know, 50 years after these people had been part of history. So, uh, so I, I had to basically annotate that. Um, and I got a very good suggestion. I mentioned um, Poldu as one of the Marconi places. The Lizard is the actual uh, station. And uh, um, David Barlow there, who has been in, for years in charge of keeping that station intact, um, actually uh, gave me a very good idea. Because one of the hesitations I have is um, the problem with, with this, how do you index a book like this? And he told me, well, the big thing to do is just to take all the um, things, the names of things, because I've detailed every ship, I've detailed every, you know, personality, what have you. Um, and, um, you know, so this is, this is the kitchen sink book, okay? <laughs> But it does need an index. Uh, but I've, I'm also working on, with the help of my uh, grandson, the one who you saw, whom you saw in that uh, photo. He's now a bit older, of course. Um, uh, on a on a book for well anybody who's curious and wants a nice, quick, well illustrated read um, about the whole thing. And um, I am hoping to get that done pretty soon. And if you um, yeah, uh, the books will be coming out, and uh, you. I, what I'm going to have happen is that this one that's really short and sweet, I'm going to see how I can get to help the uh, Chatham Marconi uh, Maritime Museum uh, get some of the uh, get some royalties out of it, because you know sustaining anything that you know it's so worthwhile and of course with this COVID-19 visits are going to be limited they have a gift shop which has got wonderful stuff in it but you know how can you go there so we're going to see about how to make it possible so the books I'm hoping that the books will be available um, in um, uh, related to the talk this one is going to take me all summer as usual <laughs> but the shorter one I I'm almost done with it and so it should be up in, on Amazon in, by the end of July. And Very nice. You did give us a preview of it, and it was wonderful. So I'm yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, so we, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we have a couple more comments, but we also have a chat. I'm not sure if you can see it. And this is uh, from Kate. And she's saying, thank you so much. We love the story. How much did you know about all of this before he died versus learning as oh. an adult? Oh, well, as I, as I said at the beginning, uh, my, my, my grandfather, well, let me, let me first explain that I was, uh, well, I was a bit precautious, precocious. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and my grandfather well, we lived some, sometimes we lived elsewhere, but whenever we were in New York City, um, which was most most years and most of years, um, we uh, actually uh, my I was deposited by my my mother uh, and my grandmother and my aunt uh, with my grandfather, and uh, my my sister who was three years younger would always have to nap. And when, in fact, when she was born, I lived with them for a while. And, and net effect was my grandfather and I were very close. He would talk to me about all kinds of things. And he told me much of this story 
He never mentioned, of course, the part about Luna Park. That I had to discover on my own because he really was so ashamed of that. But, but otherwise, he, uh, he told me, and in fact, I think my mother said, I had never, she had never seen this. He showed me the wounds he had on his leg from that accident that he was in. Uh, and uh, it, it was a miracle that he could walk, in my opinion. And, you know, I'm an MD, so I, I, that, well, he knew I was going to be an MD even when I was a kid. And, and so that image of that leg, or those legs, because, they're, you know, both of them, but one was particularly damaged. Uh, have been engraved in my mind as his voice and his words. And I was 16 when he died. And by the time I was 16, oh, he had told me pretty much everything. Yeah. All right. So Kate has another comment. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing. Reminds us all to learn from grandparents when we have the chance. Yes. Absolutely great lesson. Yes. And I want to put in a plug for something um, that is, you know, in this day of COVID and when people are so separated from each other and especially separated from grandparents, which makes it very hard to actually uh, communicate. Um, I want to put in a plug for making sure that your, uh, you know, your grandparental generation have something to record their voices on and to tell their stories. And if you, uh, you know, think, I personally have been working with storyworth.com, which gives you prompts and questions and you could write down all parts of your life. But I think giving a, a series of prompts and that people can record with their voice, uh, you know, so you don't have to deal with a computer, you can do it by, with voice. That is such an enormous gift. Um, now, I, I see something. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, Ron, very much. Um, uh, going back to the talk, Glenn has a question. I, going back about how the transmitter work, I would love to hear your description. I'll tell you what, Glenn, um, because I don't know when people want to stop and how, I, I really want to know how detailed you want to have the answer to that and how much people really want the answer. But um, I could go back to that if you want. I don't know. It's up, it, I don't know how much time I have or how to. Yeah, do you wanna make, give a high level um, I'll, answer? I'll give, I'll, give, I'll give a basic one. Okay, okay. let me That's go good. back to the, let me go back to the share screen. Hold on, troops. You know, I love wireless. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is great. And you're, you, there's some really nice comments. Like Ron is a ham radio operator. Um, yeah. so thank you for those comments. That's fabulous. There's another comment from Arthur that Jack Bins must have been a gutsy fellow. Oh, he sure was. <laughs> That's great. While you're searching. You know, and he didn't, he didn't, t I must admit, he didn't take guff from anybody, including me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, I, I, you know, I wasn't scared of him exactly but I respected him. And if he said, don't do that. And he used to call me big tut because he loved Tutankhamun. And I was big tut and my sister was little tut. And he said, if you do that big tut, you better. <laughs> and you listen, huh? That's great. Oh yeah. I listened to him way sooner than I would listen to my parents. I'll tell you. <laughs> great. Okay. All righty. So we're back at the 7777 patent and this is, let me go through the letters here um, because they, you can really kind of follow what has to happen. But uh, the basic goal of this system is to have in F, which is the antenna, a high voltage, which is to say a high, high pressure oscillating current, a current that goes back and forth very fast. And when it goes back and forth very fast, it sends out radio waves. And if the voltage is high enough, those radio waves will travel far enough. And, um, and then they have to be picked up again by another, uh, you know, an, an, an antenna. Uh, and when I say picked up, what that radio wave will do will cause an oscillating current in the, in the, in the far away antenna, which will then go back during the, to the sort of receiving system and will, we can talk about the receiving system, but the big deal was the sending system. 
and Marconi was very proud of his 7777 patent. Um, and so that's what F is. Now let's go back down to A because the question is how do you end up getting two things very important. One thing is you have to get enough voltage going. And the other thing is you have to have it make an oscillating current, not a direct current. And if you, uh, ships in those days and batteries, of course, give you a, what's called a direct current. That is to say the current only flows in one direction. It doesn't go back and forth as an alternating or oscillating current. Does that make sense? Keep, no, keep uh, you know, asking questions if it doesn't. Um, Liz will keep an eye on the questions there. <laughs> so what we have there is uh, an A that it represents basically the battery. And, and, and before the collision, that was the, 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 the main that came down uh, from the, from the um, ship. Let me just uh, show you, I think I'm, I'm going to, uh, oh, no, it's the one previous. Um, basically, what, what, was, what was coming down in here was the, was the direct um, current from the ship. So, um, so that's A. And B, as you can imagine, is the key. And when you close the key, in other words, you create a circuit like this that goes from A through B through what's marked here as C. Now, the C is a very interesting phenomenon. It's called an induction coil or a room corp. Room corp. Oh, gosh. I'm not. Ah, I, folks, I'm going to have a sip of water. <laughs> mm. Room corp coil. And what it is, is there's an, in, uh, there's an inner coil and an outer coil. And the, the idea behind induction is that if you have a, a electric current going through one coil, it can induce a current through another coil, even though they're not part of the same circuit, so long as one is close enough to the other. And basically this whole system depends on, on you know, inducing currents in one way or another. But what the key thing is that, that uh, C has an inner coil that's connected to A and B, and then um, the outer coil is connected um, to those little balls there where C is, and that's the spark gap. And um, the, that, in order for that circuit to be completed, a couple of things have to happen. Uh, the first is you have to get the voltage high enough. And the way that uh, C wor the induction coil works is it, it, it ups the voltage. And then the other thing you want to have is an oscillating current. And what you have on there E is what's called a condenser. And that's what the Leyden jars are. Um, if we go back here, uh, D are those Leyden jars there. And what they do actually is... Um, uh, accumulate uh, volt, uh, accumulate charge and then discharge. And they'll do that very, very quickly. And the net effect of that accumulation of charge and discharge will lead to the current going back and forth. It goes on and off, on and off, on and off. So it's going back and forth. In other words, the electrons are being pulled in one direction. And then when the, when, um, the system is, is not completed, it goes back in the other direction. And, and um, you can then get the two things up. You can make the current oscillate and you can also get the uh, voltage high enough and the voltage has to be high enough for the spark to actually cross the gap there. Um, so that, that's part of that system. Now what you see there in D and D prime are, are again, two coils. They're, not, they're around each other and this is just diagrammatic of course here. Um, but basically what you're doing now with the current that's going through the circuit that is E, C, and D um, is to induce a current in where it says D prime, okay? Now, um, you'll notice that, that one end of that coil is grounded. That's what E is. Um, and then the other end of that coil goes up to G. And G is basically a system for tuning, uh, for in a way changing the length of the antenna and, uh, and therefore uh, changing the, um, the frequency with which those radio waves are going to be sent out. Does that all make sense? Any questions on that one? 
Well, I know Glenn and um, Dick Kraser appreciate that answer. So Dick wrote in and asked for more for a lot of details. So um, that was seemed very thorough. Um, but Glenn or Dick, if you have other comments, I'm sure Virginia would like oh, to answer. Sure. Oh, yeah. sure. And, and what I'm going to do now is is go back to to being me. Um, um, hold on. There. there we, no. There she is. Okay. Great. Right. There I am. Okay. <laughs> All right. We did have a, a one more question about the books. So Virginia, what would be the best way um, to purchase the books? I'll tell you what. If you go, um, if you go onto um, my webpage, which is uh, jackbins.org, um, www.jackbins.org. What you can do there is actually communicate with me. And I have been, you know, Liz has been doing that as, <laughs> as we've been going along. And I can, I can be sure to send you out any information that right. you, you would need. Uh, and uh, the other thing I want to do, um, yeah, because then, then I'll have, have the date. I should tell you, I have got like six projects going. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a July 1st deadline for one of them. So, so it may take it to mid July, but I'm, I've, I've really, and of, of course, you know, I have to communicate with my grandson because he, A, a he's very interested, but of course the other thing is, um, he is my best and worst critic. In other words, you know, he, he already gave me, a, you know, you should do this, you should do that. If this is not readable, you can, you know. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to have a critic in the house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. All right. So here's a little feedback on your answer from our engineers. Uh, yes. Dick was very happy. He hopes he can remember that. Um, and um, I think Glenn, you uh, as Glenn is an engineer, so he he ha he was happy to hear in non engineering. Uh, Techno um, terminology. So. Oh yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, um, uh, as part of the of sort of the sh these two books, but especially as the shorter one, because that patent picture is in there, I had to um, um, actually, and and I see your a question, Tom. Um, 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 what what I had to do was figure out. A way to talk about it that somebody had no clue what what I was talking about, and so I passed my description along <laughs> and worked on it to get it to a point where it would actually make sense to a non engineer yeah exactly uh, so Tom, the book Thunderstruck attempts to describe marconi 's equipment for non technical people. He says the sending required a lot of force at the key. Is this true? No, you just have to you just have to um, um, press it down enough to make the make the make the circuit close the circuit. Um, I don't I don't and and what uh, he also describes the sound of the key transmitter as being very loud. What is loud is the spark gap. And if you've ever been around a spark gap, and you guys have one, Liz, right at the at the at the museum. So where we do, I think you yeah. have you have a display with a spark gap. My God, that makes a sound. <laughs> and uh, and that that in fact, you know, when my grandfather was in his cabin with the wall having come down, the passengers, you know, saw this spark going on and wanted to know what it was, and and it was loud, and it, it, they thought something, you know, it was some kind of magic. Uh, horrible magic and uh and uh you know he had to calm them down and said you know I, I have to listen he had his you know with his earphones and and we are going to this is part of our effort to save you and he you know he basically ex explained to the people crowding around him that they had to fall silent which they did because they uh, he basically calmed them down and and helped them deal with the situation and helped himself deal with the situation yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Glenn is telling us apparently we have a spark gap in the attic, so Virginia, you might have to I come here so. at some point and help us put it together. Uh, okay, <laughs> once this COVID nonsense is over. Yeah, uh, and um, uh, there's, where was the other spark gap? There's one in, um, at the, um, isn't there one in, um, in Orleans? In well, um, uh, and, the, and the seashore? 
Oh, okay. I well, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And, uh, but, but the thing is that that thing is, it, it crackles like crazy. It's yeah. very loud. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. That having a, having, you don't want anybody to play. That's not a toy. No. And in fact, the one in, um, in Wellfleet, well, when I saw the one at your place, they must have had it down from the attic, but it was surrounded by, um, you know, glass or like plexiglass, or glass or, plexiglass yeah, or, for protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. We have a nice comment from Jen. I'm also an engineer, mechanical, but wish I remembered more of my electrical engineering class. Talk <laughs> has been great. Thank Absolutely. you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. And uh, as I said, I, I have um, I have this web page and it's linked. You can click the link to communicate directly with me. I try to answer my emails every day, so so I'll be able to. And uh, um, yeah, this has been a very, very wonderful, exciting moment. And I want to thank from the bottom of my heart, really. Uh, the Chatham Marconi Maritime Museum because they have this is not the first time I've interacted with you all but <laughs> because um, there was a, a German group who had come to do a, a video at the museum and uh, that was you know really exciting as well and I, I you know even when um, the museum isn't open, go to the website and just take a tour because it's absolutely fascinating, all the things that you can learn. And of course, when things are, uh, when virtual tours are no longer necessary, it's a wonderful place to go. And don't forget Cape Cod is a wonderful place to go yeah. in general. Yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, and uh, that seashore uh, is fabulous. And, and um, so, and we're hoping to hear news about um, museum opening soon. So we just encourage everybody to check our website about the museum as well as about other um, our other speaker series. As we are trying to move forward with our Radio to the Rescue program, albeit we're having to accommodate circumstances um, as they arise, just like we did tonight. Um, but appreciate your um your time and and um the wonderful story so with that what i'm gonna do virginia is just you know show you this <laughs> and you will be getting this in the mail it's our yes. chatham marconi maritime hat and oh, we, we hope that you'll uh, find it uh, very useful fabulous. so um we'll get <coughs> that in the so mail much. to you but uh, as a okay. as a no, thank you no hurry, I'm not going anywhere at this point. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> well, we'll we'll be in touch and uh, hope to uh, have you come visit us uh, as circumstances uh, permit. And I yeah. really would like to thank everybody that participated tonight. Um, the questions are fabulous, and thank you for for listening. And uh, stay tuned for more. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much.